Cats was, it wasn't a really an impossible idea, you know. It was just that it was, uh, it, it was just a whole set, uh, selection of wonderful verse that I decided I'd like to try and see if I could set to music, um, because I'd never really worked that way round, round before. When I had written Superstar and Evita and Josie with the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Tim Rice, uh, he tended to put the words to the music afterwards. And so I just, for my own interest, I thought, I'll try and set these poems. Maybe we'll have a kind of concert piece or something. I knew them from when I was a kid. My mother used to read them to me, and then I used to, I used to love them anyway. I, I often used to just read them in bed and think, you know, these are so very, very brilliant pieces of verse. Of course, I mean, he wrote them for children, but he really wrote them for adults too, because they were the children of all his friends and his cr you know, crowd in London at the time, and they were pretty intelligent children, I would imagine. It's really very interesting also because when I was writing them, I, I kind of got the feeling that he had had some kind of music in mind. And when uh, I finally met his widow, Valerie, uh, and she gave us permission to, to set the poems and indeed to take it forward to the musical in the form that it did, um, she told me that he, in fact, wrote an awful lot of them to melodies that were hits of the day. Quite interesting. I, 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 I think I, in one case, I think I know what it what one of them must have been. But no, just because the, the meter follows almost exactly something, I think I know, but uh, she certainly said that that's what he did. And in fact, what happened was that Valerie Elliott gave us uh, the story of Grisabella, the glamour cat, which was a poem that was not published in the original book. And, and several other uh, poems, which, uh, and bits and pieces and fragments that he had written. So that we, funnily enough, um, what, what we did was very much based on some fragments and this hint he gave us about what could be perhaps a stage event. He thought that Grisabella, I mean, in fact, it's quite interesting, there was an interview he gave, which I happened to see on television uh, only about two years ago. And he, he was talking about the bit of Rhapsody in a Windy Night that we used to, as the basis for memory. And it was interesting, the, the lines that he quoted were almost exactly the same as the ones that we picked when we used the, as, a, as the basis for the song. And he obviously had a kind of fascination with, I think when he was in Paris, he had a kind of fascination with fallen women, and, and that's Grisabella, of course. We were given permission by Valerie Elliott, which was wonderful, to be able to dip into the main body of his work. And it's from that, it's from Rhapsody on a Windy Night, that memory comes. There was a poem at the beginning, which was about dogs and cats, which in fact we adapted for the, I mean, we, we had, uh, Richard Stilgo um, adapted that poem so that it was only about cats for the beginning of us. But the, uh, the opening, beginning, that is all, or that's not in the original book, it is absolutely based on something he wrote. Are you blind when you're born? Can you see in the dark? Can you look at a king? Would you sit on his throne? Can you see of your bite that it's worse than your bark? Are you cock of the walk? When you're walking alone? Because jellicles are and jellicles do. Actually, I mean, the show, in a sense, I, I think does reflect some of the spirit of Eliot's writings in, in his more serious work. And that I think we, we really tried to stick to that pretty, pretty much. I mean, I was very, very pleased that the performance that was given for the, like when we became the longest running musical on Broadway, I mean, I was very, very pleased that the characterization of the show still seemed to be very, very much there. There's a man over there with a look of surprise. As much as to say, well now, how about that? Do I actually see with my own very eyes a man who's not heard of a genical cat? What you can't do, people That's think, well, this is a whole collection of cat poems, and I mean, it's not an arbitrary order or, or anything. It's, a, it's actually through composed really pretty, pretty much. I mean, the first act, for example, is actually quite tightly composed from end to end. 
and uh, apart from the growl tiger sequence which is just meant to be kind of pantomime and fun um, so is the second act so it's the, the beginning of it is the end of the show and it all, it all knits together in a way the music had to kind of do that because in, with, with the uh, whole load of different constituents and ingredients the music is the, has to be the thing that is the knitting force really then the pugs and the palms hold no longer aloof but some from the balcony some from the roof joined into the den with a <laughs> Until you could hear them all over the park. Until you could hear them all over the park. We went to Gillian first um, because we knew there would have to be quite a considerable dance ingredient. But after we had done the performance, which we did at my little arts festival, we uh, I do every year, um, when we realised we got something really bigger than we thought we had, um, then we went to Trevor Nunn who had actually done a, a couple of musical type things before, admittedly at the Royal Shakespeare Company, you know, only, but not commercially, but he had done a kind of musical of the Comedy of Errors and Once in a Lifetime he had directed, and they showed that he had a great command of music. So I felt, and um, Cameron McIntosh felt, when we sort of thought we might try and do this together, we felt that it was the right choice. Musicals are a very collaborative form. I mean, they uh, be th this or Phantom of the Opera or Una Vita or whatever. You know, they were all they were all pieces where, it, if any one of the ingredients had not been right, we probably wouldn't be here today. It's it, it, they are hugely collaborative, and I think it makes. And also, I mean, there are different directors are right for different things. You know, there are there. I mean, I there, I think. Trevor Nunn probably wouldn't have done what Hal Prince did for the Phantom of the Opera, but then Hal Prince would never have got cats together. Jellicle cats develop slowly. Jellicle cats are not too big. Jellicle cats are roly polling. We know how to dance a gavot and a jig. In its own way and in its own terms, it is a very, very good musical. It's very entertaining. And it, it, all of the ingredients in it are, are, are really pretty strong, I think. I, I think one of the things that I think comes over now today when one looks at it is just how ahead of its time and underestimated the choreography is. I think what Gillian Lynn did with it is, is really extraordinary. And suddenly one begins to realise now after all these years and all the other musicals that have been on since, you know, just how, how revolutionary in a way what she was doing was, and yet people didn't really see it at the time, I don't think. Reserving our terms to Korean powers runs by the light of the Jellicle Moon. I have to say, I mean, John Napier, I mean, was really the architect of all of this. And, I mean, it's a, it's a very brilliant vision that he's come up with. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a fairly staggering piece of work. Cats, yes, in various places and houses around the place. Joseph marks the beginning of, you know, one of the most crucial collaborations in the British 20th century theatre. Well, Joseph was a chapter of accidents, really. And a schoolmaster friend of ours called Alan Doggett invited us to write something for his end-of-term school play. We, we sort of thought of lots of stories. We, we could, we, one time we were thinking of sort of doing a, a spy kind of James Bond type story. I think then Tim looked through his wonder book of Bible stories and came up with the, uh, the story of, uh, of the guy who was exiled and uh, driven into slavery and came back and, and saved his country and, and brought it into economic renewal. And we came up with Joseph. And from that point, back in 1968, 
March the 1st, when Joseph was first performed, it just grew and grew and grew. You wouldn't say it was a flawless masterpiece. You'd just say it was a wonderfully fresh, inventive new piece of musical theatre. I think Tim Rice is right, you know. He once said to me, did I do this? Were we that young, that fresh, that innovative? And they, it was such a wonderfully unselfconscious piece of writing by them both, at, you know, just as they started out. And it's got that bloom on it of freshness, immediacy and absolute charm. <laughs> The Stephen Pimlock Palladium production, I mean, has been, I suppose, probably the best and the most successful around the world, I mean, of, of any Joseph that we've ever had. Andrew, um, Andrew Lloyd Webber, I had um, seen a production I'd done of Carmen, an arena production. Why he should think I would be a suitable choice for Joseph, I don't know. And as the other piece of work I had on that year was Julius Caesar, I thought it would make um, a pleasant contrast. The team responsible was Stephen Pimlock, the director, and Mark Thompson, the um, designer. Um, they have great operatic experience, even at that stage. They've done quite a lot of work in musical theatre and operas. I don't know what I really brought to it. I mean, I started off, like I do with most things, of, of telling the story. Um, it's a very good story, and it's very well told. You did feel, were they breaking a butterfly on a wheel? Had they taken a hammer to a nut, as it were? You know, and you've got the Egyptian slaves coming on like Mediterranean gay waiters in their white mini skirts. Um, and I did think it was a little over the top and probably putting too much strain on it. But um, I was in a minority of about minus one, I think. The audience <laughs> absolutely loved it. It's all about listening to the interpretation of needs. All your lives have been a misery in the court ever since he's had these bloody dreams. So it will just free it up a little bit, make it more about listening and a little bit less, less choreographed. Oh, well, we've had several Josephs. The first was Jason Donovan, uh, who was a lovely guy at, at the time, at the height of his career as a pop idol. You couldn't get through the stage door, actually, every performance. There were, there were thousands of people there, and he was very charming and, and, and very fresh and had a certain sort of naivety and innocence, which was marvellous for the part. I look handsome, I look smart, I am a Then came Philip Schofield. I went for uh, went to the to the Lyric Theatre in Hammersmith for an audition, and it wasn't really a very auspicious start because he asked if I could do any dream will do, and I couldn't remember how it finished. Who had a lovely dry English wit and a sort of mischievous twinkle, which suited Tim's lyrics very well, and also he proved himself a wonderful singer. Andrew had arrived and I said, where would you like me to stand? And he'd said in a very gruff voice, in the middle might be a good idea. So really it was looking very ugly. I thought this, is, this has not been a very good idea at all. And then a couple of days later they phoned up and said, if you want to do it, it's yours. Then came Donny, who of course we have now, who, I mean, comparisons are invidious and, and all of them were brilliant in their different ways. But Donny has something I think very special. Um, he's able to play both ends of the spectrum, really, the, the very naive boy who begins the story and the man who, uh, that he becomes. I closed my eyes Drew back the curtain To see for certain what I thought I knew. I was given the script and I thought, oh, this isn't really what I want to do. I want to progress a little bit further because it's typical. You know, Joseph donned in white, long hair, big smile. Donny Osmond, perfect, typecasting. But then I started reading the script a little bit more and I realized there's a lot more to it than, than just that, that cute side of Joseph. There's the, that roller coaster ride of emotions into the jail and the prison and eventually he's in charge of Egypt. To be able to pull off someone at 18 years old all the way to 40 years old within about an hour and a half worth of time uh, would be a stretch, would be difficult to pull off and be believable. So I, th I said, let's try it for maybe six months. 
about six years later, I said, that's enough. <laughs> we certainly never expected it to become anything like the phenomenon it is today. Certainly, anybody writing a 20-minute piece for a school would never expect it, 30 years on, to become one of the world's most performed musicals, having played Broadway, the West End, all over the world, literally, and now being made into a major video film. You just do not expect these things.